What's up, marketers, and welcome to another episode of the Growth Colony Podcast. I'm Liza from X-Growth to tell you that each episode we bring in B2B leaders to chat about how you can achieve those everyday wins in the marketing world. Whether you're new to the B2B game, working at a leadership level, or even just showing some interest, we know you'll love the episode. So grab a drink, get comfy, and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode. I'm Shane Hoda with X Growth, and today I'm talking to William Hasco of Dell Technologies about the changing marketing landscape we're currently facing from dealing with budget changes to team rearrangements and introduction of new capabilities and technologies. There's a lot of change that is happening, and there's a lot of ups and downs. So I'm really excited to uh, to to kind of explore this with with Will and uh, draw from his experience as well. So on that note, I'm going to dive right into the first question. Thanks for joining us, Will. I'm happy to be involved. One of the things that I want to touch on and uh, and dive a little bit deeper in is with regards to the sh- strategy and, and, and the approach that you take when it comes to shrinking budget. So this is obviously something that a lot of organizations are are kind of facing. And I want to really dive into the meats and potatoes a little bit later, especially around prioritization. But at a high level, I'd love to hear from your side in terms of how do you approach the situation where you experience or you might experience a shrinking budget or, you know, the, the resources are getting a little bit tighter. Yeah, I think that, you know, the reality is as marketers, you do go through different seasons where things are easy and things are hard. And I think when things are easy, it doesn't necessarily mean that like you just have tons of money. I think it's when the business is doing well, when everyone is kind of happy, when team morale is high. I think one of the things that doesn't happen in a lot of places is you don't get interrogated. You're not getting tested every day on why are you choosing the things you're choosing, why are you making the bets you're making, and having to constantly answer those kinds of questions. When things aren't easy, I think that correlates a lot to when you are being questioned a lot. And a lot of the time you're being questioned a lot because budgets are tighter, because the business isn't doing as well. They're looking at their investments a lot closer. And marketing is something which some organizations can view as discretionary spending. Some organizations can view as mandatory spending. Some organizations can view it as an expense. Some can view it as an investment. Like There are lots of different ways that big and small organizations look at marketing. And that can probably come down to the kind of people at the top, their backgrounds, where do these companies come from, what are they built on? All of those kinds of things I think can influence it. But the bottom line is when you're getting asked a lot, why are you doing what you're doing? The tone of everything kind of changes. And I think that my advice to people kind of going through that or who have been going through that is first and foremost, you need to know why you're doing what you're doing. Like just fundamentally, like why are you making these kinds of decisions? And I think for me, it's trying to have a very crystal clear idea of your kind of vision as a team. What is your plan built on? Like why are you choosing different areas of investment? Why are you investing 40% of your budget in brands instead of 70%? Or why are you only investing 10% in search when you should be doing 40%? Like whatever it is, you just need to have a very clear idea. Like why does the shape of my plan look like what it looks like? And I think if you understand that, then you can talk to it and communicate it to people who might not understand marketing language a lot better. And you're able to communicate on a little bit more of like an even playing field of actually saying like, okay, well, these are the things that we're trying to achieve. This is the approaches we're taking to try to achieve those goals. This is how much each of these things cost. This is how, or this is what we're expecting to get back for it. And so I think that makes it, a lot more, a lot easier to probably have those conversations and to communicate. Um, so that's probably like the, uh, the number one thing I would say is when when times are tough, you need to understand why are you investing in what you're investing, and that can help you. You know, you mentioned prioritization. That can help you prioritize. So then you can make some decisions of if you do have to put 10, 15, 20 percent of your budget, like where does that happen? And I think that's then going to be you know what things are contributing the least to those kind of more ultimate outcomes. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it almost sounds like it it needs to be an educational exercise and you need to know your stuff well enough to be able to educate others. Yeah, I, I would agree 
wholeheartedly. And I think the reality is, it's probably sad to say, and I'm sure all of your listeners are the exception, not the rule, but a lot of marketers, I don't, I don't think they know what those ultimate goals that they're trying to achieve are necessarily. They might just be working to, like more what I would refer to as like end KPIs, like revenue, right? It's an end KPI. But there are a lot of steps that happen between, hey, we put out an ad or we have host an event or we host this campaign and a, and a purchase. There's a lot of different steps that go on between them. And if all you're saying is, yeah, I'm putting this out to try and drive a sale, it's like, yeah. It's like, do you really understand how you're driving that sale? Like, what are you trying to convince people to do? Like, what's the core value that you're trying to communicate that's going to make them want to solve a problem with your product? And I think that if you don't understand those things, when times are tough, it can be really difficult. Um, while I think if you really do understand it, then you have a much better chance of being able to tweak your plan effectively. I've probably been lucky that throughout my career, when I've dealt with these things, yeah, I haven't. It's, it's, it's a weird thing to say, but I haven't found it that challenging because in the end, I, I still view, right, we are given a budget as a marketing team and we have goals to drive. And I believe if we can do the most effective job of spending our money, we will drive the best outcome we can, right? Is that going to be good enough for the business? Is that going to hit a target? Like maybe, maybe not. But if I believe we're doing the best we possibly can with our budget, then I don't know if I would have changed anything. So I think that's always an approach I've tried to take is like, just focus on doing the best marketing you can, right? And you have to understand how you get from A to B to do that. I love it. I love it. You touched on prioritization. I definitely want to expand on that a little bit more as well. How do you go about, I mean, obviously, e even if one educates really well and explains everything, in a lot of situations, you can't keep everything that you were planning to do if your budgets are getting tighter. How do you go about prioritizing your, you know, the, the, the initiatives that you were planning on, on doing and, and basically making sure that it is those initiatives are within the budget that um, the, the new budget that, for example, that you have? Yeah, I think that this this can be like obviously really challenging. Right. And I will say I've never been I've never really tried to take the approach of being six or being successful of like arguing to keep my money. If someone's trying to take my money away, generally, I don't you know, by the time I find out about it, I don't really have a say in it anymore. You know, maybe there's a little bit of wiggle room, but you know, I've never been like, Oh, you've got to cut your budget in half. And then I argue about it and they're like, Oh yeah, just keep it all. Right? Like, <laughs> it's not really how things work. Is it? So I think that it, I, I would say there are two different ways to do this. Like it's kind of, you know, the first option, and I think what's probably going to drive the best outcomes if you have the time and um, ability to do it is you, have, you just start from scratch, right? If you're cutting your budget substantially, how do you just rebuild your plan from the beginning like you were trying to achieve the same goals or revised goals if the goals have been uh, altered as well uh, with your new budget, right? Like don't get attached to money that essentially was never yours, if that makes sense. I think the other way to do it, and especially with smaller cuts, is obviously looking at your plan and trying to decide what can go. I, f I find the problem with that is a lot of the times, by the time you have a plan in place, you might have briefed out partners. You, you, in some cases, you may have already agreed to certain things, and now you're having to cut. The reality is that a lot of things that happen in that time is you start getting grilled on just what's the easiest thing to cut. Right? You're not thinking about long-term output. You're thinking about, geez, I'm already halfway through the quarter or the half or the year, and I now have to go to my partners and say, hey, I told you you had X, but now you have Y. That's a really hard thing to do. And so I do think that like in an ideal world, if you, if you find out about these kinds of changes and you're still in planning, is actually just going back to the drawing board and trying to achieve the same goals or revised goals with a new budget, I think is going to give you the best chance of success because then you're able to make sure all of the pieces kind of are the right size to each other. If you have to cut, like, and then you have to go through that exercise of prioritization, I, I do think that, you know, coming back to the first conversation was have a really crystal clear idea of what you're trying to achieve. And is there activity that you're doing, doesn't matter if it's brand, doesn't matter if it's performance, that is contributing less to that end goal than other things. And I would like to say that there always is going to be, right? Not all activity is created equal. In a plan, some stuff is inherently more important than others. And so there should be some activity that, you know, might have always been a little discretionary, right? You know, maybe you had a little bit too much money, so you put it all into search or you put it all into, or you just like, you know, 
maybe one of the partners pitched something which was an extra 10% to what they were doing and you've bought into it, okay? You probably don't need that, right? I think that, you know, going through that can be easy or can be really hard. I think that the biggest thing that I would say is to try to defend the activity that you truly believe in. Um, If there are parts of your plan that you really believe are important, maybe it's testing. A lot of people cut test and learn campaigns first. I've always tried to take the approach that like that's what's going to make you better next year. So how do you keep that, right? Or keeping things, or a lot of people will cut brand campaigns but will preserve search campaigns or performance level campaigns because the performance campaigns are so much easier to show return. But, you know, is that the best approach? I think there'll be a lot of arguments to say no. So it's kind of like, and that's why I said go back to the drawing board and do it again is because then I think you will, hold the core shape of your plan like what's the core mix of testing versus brand versus performance or search versus leads versus events like if you go back to the drawing board you'll probably build a plan that looks relatively similar just at a smaller scale and i think that's probably the best thing to do i love that i love that i i I really like the fact that, that that the two advice that you gave it's like think about the performance versus brand, and you probably are going to more in, be inclined to cut the perform, uh, cut the brand than the performance, and that's going to probably hurt you long term. And then the experimental programs of making sure that there is an element of that that is left, because those are also definitely the first things that uh, get cut out. Uh, such great advice. I want to ask you about team as well, and how do you handle changes in team roles and also morale specifically with when uh, when budgets get cut yeah I, to be honest this is probably and for any manager i think this is some of this is kind of can be the hardest part of your job because the reality is teams are like everyone in a team is different and people deal with change really really differently so i think first and foremost you've got to take care of yourself and making sure you understand what's going on and you're confident in the decisions of the company, the strategy of the company, and you embody that, right? Because if you're there as a leader questioning a lot of these decisions, being pessimistic about the future, that, like, the team have no one else to look at than you, right? And so that is going to send a really, really bad message and make it really difficult to then build morale, right? And so I do think that, like, first and foremost, you need to understand enough to be confident that in a lot of situations, people work for very big, very successful companies that exist to make themselves, their shareholders money and do right by their customers, right? And there has to be a certain amount of trust in those decisions. And I'm not saying that's easy. And sometimes it's probably really hard. And I'm not saying all companies make good decisions by any means, but I do think that a lot of these companies, they make the decisions they make for reasons. And as a leader, I think you need to try to take it upon yourself to understand why. Whether you agree or not can be a different story, but understand like what, what's behind this. Because fundamentally, when people are going through change and when people are experiencing what they might perceive as negative change, they're always going to be asking why. And they think that there's been a mistake, right? And so I think that as a leader, you need to understand so you can communicate why. I think that's the first part is kind of trying to take care of yourself and make sure you're educated to represent the company to your team because that inherently is your job. And then I think, as I said, that like people deal with change really differently is really understanding your team, like caring about your team and emotionally connecting to them. So you can almost like look around and be like, who needs more help right now? Right? Like who really needs my time as a leader? right now because i promise you some people in your team are fine right they absorb it they've been through this before they kind of just keep going maybe the change didn't impact them as much and so they might feel a little isolated or a little protected from it what other people in your team whether they individually were changed whether your role turns or whether they were impacted personally i think some people in teams are just more sensitive to change period and when they see it going on around them it causes them to be a lot less confident or a lot more questioning and you know a lot more anxious about it and i think that trying to understand your team at an individual level to understand who needs your help and how do you help them i think it's the other side of it so if i had to summarize that i would say one really understand the change yourself so you can represent it clearly to the team and answer their questions 
And secondly, is really, you know, take the time to understand who in your team needs your time right now and give it to them. Um, because if your team are worried, if your team can't do their job effectively, then as a leader, that's terrible for you. And it just kind of, you know, ripples outwards. So I think, you know, taking the time to care is important. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's just such great points there. And, and, you know, one of the things that the one sees quite often in these situations is I, I think not understanding that first, first point and then the leader coming out and be like, Oh, they cut our budgets and bad mathing the company. And, just which which doesn't really instill confidence in the team and, and it erodes that that certainty or confidence or that they have someone to rely on because they kind of look at their their leadership and they feel like they're in shambles and they're like oh well these guys don't know anything and they're constantly complaining and and it just trickles down yeah exactly exactly and i think that you know obviously i'm not the first person to say that when change is going on and like when worry happens within an organization it can spread like a virus right um whether it's negative gossip whether it's you know just general anxiety about people losing jobs like whatever it might be right and whether it's built on fact or not it does spread and it does and, and I think the biggest thing as well is like when that stuff starts to happen, it impacts the way people are spending their time. It impacts the way people are doing their job. And it just cascades, right, is that the people start doing a worse job. People are caring less. People are missing things. So it just kind of compounds and compounds and compounds. So I think that, you know, when I've personally been through these situations before as a leader, my priority has always been really understanding, does this impact me and my team now? Like, does it? Does it, does it change the job? Because a lot of the time, a lot of front end marketers or salespeople, whoever it might be, your fundamental job isn't changing. You still have the same job to do. You just might be reporting into a different part of the organization, or your leadership is changing, or you know someone who you might know never have heard of is replacing the job of someone else you've never heard of. Like those things can happen quite far away. But if people talk and people start to get worried, it feels really personal. In most, not all, but in most of the scenarios I've been through, my actual job and my delivery and that of my team hasn't changed. And so I think helping people to understand, like, really, what is the impact here? Because as we said before, like, if, you're, if you've got a really crystal clear idea of what your team does and what your vision is and what you're trying to do, has any of that changed? Because you still have the same customers, you're still selling the same products, and we're marketers, and our job is to connect a brand and a product to a customer. So in a lot of cases, you know, what you have to do isn't changing, but just the environment you're operating in changes. And I think that if you could help people to stay focused on, it's all good, this stuff's happening, it's going to be a chaotic couple months, but like, let's focus on what we can control. Let's focus on the job ahead of us. You can kind of keep going. Um, mm. And, you know, you've got to fend off a lot of those conversations and try to quell any of the worry. But fundamentally, you're still going, you're still spending money, you're still trying to drive an outcome, you're still trying to talk to customers. So um, I think that, you know, as I said, really trying to understand the change before you worry about the change is important. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Will, have you come across or tried any innovative methods throughout your experience where you found effective for kind of stretching marketing budgets further? Um, interesting question. So look, I think that I, so I'll, I'll, I'll start off with like a no and then we'll kind of get to a yes. <laughs> okay, all right. Because fundamentally, like I've had the great privilege of always working for pretty big brands and big brands tend to have the like process of what kind of things are we investing in? What kind of partners are we working with? How do we mm. create assets? Like how do we localize assets? How do you go through all of that? Reasonably uh, set, right? In terms of it's one of the things is that inherently I would say, especially working in Australia rather than in the US or in like, you know, England or something, you can have a lot less creative freedom. It doesn't mean you don't have creative power or autonomy, but you have less freedom to go and shoot an adult on iPhone. Right, like you, you don't, you generally don't have those options, which I think a lot of smaller brands, to be honest, you can actually get really creative. Right, you could be testing new AI software to make an ad and put it out into market next week. A lot of the bigger brands, because of the way that the brands are kind of governed and protected, which I think is incredibly important, 
you don't necessarily have that ability to go and be like, oh, my budget got cut, so I'm going to go and do something super cheap and, you know, rogue and go out and it goes viral. Like, eh. it's like, it's not, it's, not, it's not the game, I, it's not the chess game I play. So the, I think in terms of how to stretch budgets though, I think that for me, those ones come down to like any time that we're having, because I, sorry, I think the way to view stretching is you're trying to achieve the same goal with less money right? Like, so you originally had using made up numbers, you originally had a hundred dollars to drive a thousand dollars of revenue. You now have $40, but you still have to drive a thousand. Like, how do you do that? And I think for me, that comes down to like consolidate into what's important and invest in that. So rather than spreading budget over numerous activities, really pick the ones that are working and double down is probably like what my personal guidance to a team would be because when you're stretched you need to come back to what's important and get rid of the peripheral because the peripheral probably isn't driving your outcomes very well and so i would say that's probably the way that i would approach it but i'm sure that you know some of your listeners or some of your other guests might actually have been in those situations where they're like we were going to spend millions of dollars on some massive brand campaign we had our budgets cut, so we went and shot it in the desert by ourselves. <laughs> like, I've, I've heard those kinds of stories, and I'm like, yeah, amazing. Like, <laughs> tell me more. But I probably haven't been in that situation where I'm trying to, you know, extract a massive ad out of, you know, no money. So, yeah. Got it. Got it. Now, this is, uh, this is, this is great. Uh, Will, I have some rapid-fire questions for you that I want to go through. Before I kind of get there, and ask those, is there anything else on kind of handling and dealing with shrinking budgets and and cutting resources that you think I maybe didn't touch on or you think it's important we should talk about? No, look, I think that if I was trying to, I guess, you know, and talking through this conversation with you, there's obviously been some similar threads across the different questions. And I think that, you know, really what I would say to anyone going through any change, right? And even if it's opposite change, right? If you're actually getting lots more money and you're getting lots more people, like how do you deal with that? I'd say, again, it's focusing on what's important and understand what your team does. I think if you have a really foundational understanding in that, both in a practical sense for the business, but also in a marketing theory sense of how you achieve your goal, then I think it lets you deal with change and communicate change a lot more effectively because you can really try to pinpoint exactly what about this moment is hard and like putting your energy into dealing with that rather than getting caught up in the change in and of itself, which sometimes isn't actually that powerful or it doesn't actually impact you and the people in your team that much. Now, sometimes it does. And I think that's where, you know, we talked about trying to understand your team at like an individual level, trying to care for them, who cares, who doesn't, who's impacted, who's not, and making sure that you're showing up for them and keeping them motivated and positive by reorienting them to that vision that they still play a really crucial role in. I think that like, you know, that as a through line, I think is, I I would stand by wholeheartedly. And I think that any change that you're going through, if you can stay focused like that, I think the team see that and the team are going to identify with that and they're going to stay focused and it's going to let you hopefully get through the change and then be able to rebuild or start adding budget or adding people into areas, you know, that can help take you forward. But fundamentally, you're still delivering the outcomes you need to drive with a smaller team or a smaller budget or a more constrained kind of environment. So I think we touched on those points. So, yeah. No, that's a that's a great way of putting it. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Are you struggling with your campaigns? Maybe they're not performing as well as you thought they would. Well, luckily for you, the team at Xgrowth have nailed the art of account-based marketing. So if you'd like to know more about how you can hop on the ABM train, book a free consultation with the account-based marketing experts at Xgrowth to help you get started with your ABM journey today. Okay, let's do some rapid fire questions. First question I have is what is one resource? This could be a book, a blog, podcast, talk, whatever it is that had had a profound impact on the way you work or live. This could be this could be something recent. It could be also something that you've come across a long time ago. I'm gonna say this is a long time ago, and I know it might be cliche now, but it didn't feel cliche then. Was the tipping point by Malcolm Gladwell. 
I'm not like a diehard Malcolm Gladwell fan, but that book I think is some of the re- is one of the reasons that I did end up going into advertising. I think just the idea that very small changes to the way we communicate and what we do can drive these outsized impacts and change mm. behavior and build brands and all of that, I think really got me interested in advertising and marketing to start with. And so I'm not going to say he's responsible for it, but uh, that definitely helped. <laughs> it definitely Love nudged it. me down the right direction if you get the joke. Yep, yep. I am, I'm with you. I'm with you. All right, question number two. If you could give one advice to B2B marketers, what would it be? I would say building on the conversation, really focus on what you what you control and understand how it can be measured. I think, you know, we, we have to show results for what we do and understand how, understand, understanding how what you believe in drives outcomes is vital. So focus on that. Love it. Well, who are some of the influencers that you follow in the, in the kind of the B2B marketing sales space? Yes, and not Tiger Woods probably. Um, I would say <laughs> two that I would recommend. Uh, one's Rory Sutherland. So he's the chairman of Ogilvy in the UK. And I think that he is of this big school of kind of Richard Thaler and Malcolm Gladwell. And he's an author. And I think he just he shows up in a good way, in a nice way. And I think he challenges conventional thinking. Uh, the other one that, who I've kind of recently discovered is Nicholas Thompson. Uh, he's a CEO of Wired. I think he used to be from the Atlantic. And he does like this segment, just like today in tech, like what's one really interesting thing happening. And I have stumbled into his videos and now I follow them and watch them religiously just to get an idea of like what's going on in the very quickly changing world of tech, um, you know, business, all of it. And I really like his point of view. So Nicholas Thompson uh, would be a yeah, absolutely. That's uh, that's gonna go on my uh, on my list. I can hear you typing too. as well. I am, I am typing, and uh, I found him. So, uh, so I'm 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 keen to uh, listen to some of the stuff that he has. Amazing. Last question: What is something that excites you about B two B today? Great question. I think that over the last, so I've been in B two B marketing for coming about a decade now, and over that period, I think that I've really witnessed the world of B2B coming more and more into the spotlight. I think that, you know, the brands that have really taken over the contemporary kind of landscape, a lot of them are B2B brands. And they've realized, as has the rest of the world, that talking about B2B at a large scale works. You know, that our B2B customers, your CIOs, your CEOs, your CMOs, whoever they are, your kind of business decision makers, your small business owners, fundamentally they are people and they consume material like people. You don't just have to have the conversation with them in a boardroom or, you know, taking someone out for a boozy lunch. Like that's not how all of this business and messages get out. And so I think that seeing B2B come into the spotlight and seeing that drive you know, really powerful, creative and really good thinking and having it treated a lot more like, you know, a historic consumer brand, I think is really exciting because it's driving a lot of creativity into an area of marketing that when I joined probably wasn't that creative. And I've seen that change and continue to change. And, you know, you now have B2B Cannes Lions Awards and like all of these things have happened really quickly. And so I would say that's, you know, something that excites me because I think that's only moving forward and seeing where that goes is the kind of creative that drives, the kind of thinking that it drives uh, is really fascinating. So I would say that's exciting. Love it. Love it. Well, just want to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This was a awesome conversation and uh, I've definitely taken a lot away from it. So I'm sure it's going to be the same thing for a lot of listeners. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you. It was great to be here. Today's episode of Growth Colony was produced by Alexander Hipwell and Liza Maywald. It was edited by Dave Semedo with additional editing by Liza Maywald and music arrangement by Alexander and Liza. Special thanks to Tina Wabe. We couldn't make the show without you. Growth Colony is hosted by Shaheen Hoda, Director of Growth at Extra. If you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe and give us a rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Do you think you'd be a great guest or just keen for a chat? Send through an email at podcast at xgrowth.com.au. That's podcast 
at xgrowth.com.au. That's all for now. We'll catch you next week right here on Growth Colony.